Hello, Colorado, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're happy to welcome uh, two respected doctors, Dr. Kyle uh, Leggett, a family doctor, a family medicine doctor from UC Health, and Dr. Sean O'Leary, director of Colorado Pediatric Practice-Based Research at Children's Hospital. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the different ways that we've worked with and are engaging with pediatricians and doctors uh, to improve our vaccination rate. We also want to welcome Captain Kirk back to Earth. He safely returned, uh, and we're excited that he is uh, back among us. Um, both of our doctors today are trusted medical professionals, and they've been working on the front line since the virus began. Uh, they um, have been working very hard and have seen up close and personal how devastating the virus can be and uh, how the vaccine is uh, really uh, an amazing resource in finally ending this pandemic and saving lives. I, I want to give a brief update on where we are as a state. Uh, we've had elevated incidents of COVID uh, this last week. Uh, we have the uh, highest level of hospitalizations that we've had uh, since January. Uh, 964 Coloradans are currently hospitalized. That's 12 lower than yesterday. I was uh, so relieved to see the first decline in several days that had been going up at a rather scary rate the last few days. But uh, it's certainly not any type of sustained decline. We have a very high rate. And, and I want to be clear, the people being hospitalized are, by and large, the unvaccinated. So of the 964 people who are hospitalized, uh, 744 are unvaccinated. Does that mean that we would have no people vaccinated if ever, I'm sorry, does that mean that we would have no people hospitalized if everybody's vaccinated? No, but it wouldn't be anything close to a crisis. We wouldn't even be here doing weekly uh, updates if only 100 people or 150 people were in the hospital. We're here because we have a crisis, a crisis of the unvaccinated. Uh, and there's a very simple step that Coloradans can take to protect themselves. And this chart is so compelling about what works. It's also, um, a wake up call to areas that have reached it. But what we're really seeing here is, is as counties are getting to 75% to 80% of their total population uh, vaccinated, you see a hospitalization rate that's about a quarter of our counties that have lower vaccination rates. First of all, this is just a clear linear correlation. Uh, congratulations to counties like Eagle, high vaccination rate, almost no one hospitalized, Boulder, Broomfield. Uh, but then, unfortunately, uh, there's some counties that uh, the word still needs to get out about the importance and the benefits of the vaccine. And there are a lot of Coloradans unnecessarily hospitalized because they didn't get the vaccine. And you know what? With some of the, the new therapies we have, many of them will recover, but some of them won't. Some of them won't make it. And even some of those who do recover will have weeks or months uh, of a very difficult and challenging recovery. And what's frustrating, of course, is that as folks in Eagle and Boulder and, 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 and Broomfield County uh, demonstrate, we have the solution. Um, the doctors who are gonna talk today of the solution, your local doctor that you see knows the solution. Uh, it is the highly effective and safe vaccine, which dramatically reduces everyone's risk. First and foremost, your risk of contracting the virus, of being hospitalized if you get it, and of dying if you are hospitalized. At every step of the way, the vaccine is highly effective at reducing your risk. And not, not you know, it's not one of those things where you just do a marginal cost benefit analysis and say, oh, it helps a little. It is a dramatic dramatic difference in risk profile. Uh, the virus is here. The virus will stay here. There will never be no risk of COVID. But your risk is substantially reduced to a reasonable level that you don't have to worry about every day once you're fully vaccinated. And again, I would encourage those who got the Pfizer vaccine more than six months ago to get a booster or those who got uh, Moderna and have a weakened immune system or are aged to get that booster. We'll have more information on that in coming events. Of the 964 people hospitalized, 11 of them are zero to 11 and eight are 12 to 17. We still see very low pediatric hospitalizations. But again, what's also sad is that eight kids 12 to 17 are, are hospitalized. None need to be. The vaccine is available now for 12 to 17 year olds. We're at about 
of 12 to 17 year olds who've had at least their first dose. Uh, and it is even more effective. The vaccine is even more effective for younger people than it is for older people. There's no need to have anybody who's 12 to 17 hospitalized today if they were simply vaccinated. Uh, let's get it done. Uh, I'm excited as the father of a uh, 10 year old and a seven year old that we hope soon uh, the vaccine will be effective for uh, allowed for five to 11 year olds. And I'll be very excited to protect my kids. Uh, we want to update people on the highly effective booster. Again, the data is just um, off the, the charts and very impressive with regard to boosters. First and foremost, the first two doses are even more important, and that's clear. And, and none of what anybody says about boosters uh, should ever distract from the fact that those first two doses give you a much higher level of protection. Uh, but there is little doubt uh, and now solid evidence in, in, in a number of studies, both um, antibody studies and, and real life data coming out of Israel about the increased efficacy that you can get, the boost that you can get from the booster. Uh, and we're excited uh, to be able to talk about that, particularly at our long term care facilities. Given the nature of our long term care facilities, uh, we planned doing the booster even before it was approved because we knew we needed to hit the ground running. This is where there are a lot of folks are not only living in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, but also live in a residential environment. Um, I'm proud to say that with the first two doses, we are at 93.5% of residents protected, 83% of staff, and we have 80% uh, uh, of our clinics scheduled for the booster, and we've already completed 45% of all our long-term care facilities for successful administration of the booster. Even more important for people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, right, the booster. It's available for Pfizer, anybody who had it six months after. If you're a frontline worker, work in retail, work in a grocery store, a teacher, you got it, you know, six, seven, eight months ago, get the Pfizer booster, it, it boosts your protection. But even more important for people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, and uh, we are leading the way now with 45% of the clinics completed, and uh, uh, we are working on scheduling that final 20% to get that booster. We're also closely tracking the data uh, for boosters across the general population of people age 65 and up, so this is not just those who live in long-term care facilities. This is everybody 65% and up, and we're at 18.3% now uh, that have gotten the booster. Uh, we're working hard to get the message out uh, to folks. And keep in mind that some might still be waiting for uh, the six months to pass. Although if you do have a weakened immune system and you're in your 70s and 80s, again, you can get it and you should get it sooner. Uh, many people with weakened immune systems uh, don't even see that sustained immune response for uh, two months, no less six months. Talk to your doctor. Uh, but 18.3% of 65 and up have gotten the booster. Uh, in fact, our very own lieutenant governor, uh, who falls into the 65 and up uh, age group, uh, got her booster. Uh, she was very excited to do so. She had um, really no impact uh, the next day, and uh, she was here to talk about it. And that's the best way so she can safely enjoy not only being our amazing lieutenant governor, but also doing the things she loves, like dancing and playing with her grandchildren who are too young to be vaccinated. Uh, and all the other great things that she enjoys in life. And I'm so thrilled that she is protected. My 77-year-old parents, 77-year-old parents have gotten the booster. We are very relieved uh, that they have that added level of protection. And uh, once it's approved for the general public for Moderna, uh, I plan on getting it as well, along with my husband, Marlon. If you're looking to get your booster or your first or second dose, you can find out a vaccination site at covid19.colorado.gov slash vaccine. Uh, and look, um, we've had many discussions uh, about the benefits, the clear benefits of, of why people should make the decision to get vaccinated. Uh, first and foremost, we do it for ourselves to protect ourselves and our loved ones. We also do it because it ends the pandemic, it protects Colorado. We also do it because we know of the extraordinary work that our hardworking medical professionals, nurses, doctors, hospitals have been going through this last year and a half now with over 960 people hospitalized from COVID. We're joined by two of our caregivers, two vaccine providers who are going to talk about their experience on the front line, healthcare professionals who have conversations with their patients, with families about the facts, about the vaccine, about the risks of the virus. Uh, throughout this entire pandemic, they show up every day uh, to help address the healthcare needs of their patients, to help get them vaccinated and protected. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kyle Leggett from UC Health. Dr. Leggett has been a family medicine doctor throughout this pandemic. And uh, that includes supporting his patients 
as they make the decision to get vaccinated and now also as they make the decision to get the booster uh, for those um, who that will benefit, which um, who, who got the vaccine six months ago or who have a weakened immune system. Uh, with that, I'll be thrilled to welcome Dr. Leggett. All right. Well, thank you, Governor Polis, for that introduction. And again, my name is Kyle Leggett. I'm a family physician, so I practice in Aurora and Lone Tree. I see patients in the clinic. I also see them in the hospital. And I teach our medical students and resident physicians as well. And I'm actually really excited and proud to be here to talk about the COVID vaccine as part of our pandemic response. And the first point that I want to make is that these vaccines help protect our most vulnerable patients. So I'm going to tell a brief story about John whose name's been changed, but he's one of those vulnerable patients. John's an 85-year-old gentleman who I take care of, and he's a cancer survivor, he has lung disease, he has high blood pressure, and he has multiple other medical conditions. So that meant it was extra scary when John was diagnosed with COVID, and he called our office, uh, worried about what was to come. But luckily, John was vaccinated, and in when he called our office, he only had mild symptoms, and we quickly got him into treatment with monoclonal antibody therapy, and I'm really happy to say that John fully recovered within two weeks. And I had a follow-up visit with John after he had recovered to talk about his experience with COVID, and he described to me meeting two other gentlemen when he was getting his infusion for monoclonal antibody therapy, two younger men with fewer medical conditions than him who also had COVID. And one of them was doing really well. He also had mild symptoms and he was vaccinated. And the other gentleman, although younger, healthier, was sicker. He had more symptoms and he told John, my patient, that he was worried about what might happen. Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment, John said that he realized that the vaccine probably saved his life or at the very least helped prevent him from being hospitalized. And so that's really the second point that I wanna make is that these COVID vaccines help prevent hospitalizations and admissions to the intensive care unit and intubation. And as Governor Polis mentioned, about 78% of our COVID hospitalized patients right now are unvaccinated. And so I'm very used to having these conversations in my clinic with patients who are hesitant about the vaccine. And I think the thing I wanna to say to those patients is, it's okay to have questions and it's okay to be uncertain about the vaccine. That's what your doctors are here for. Those are the conversations that we wanna have and those are the questions that we wanna answer. So recently I had a teacher come into my office who was worried about the potential side effects from the COVID vaccines and her medical conditions. And we spent three visits over the course of the next three weeks talking about the vaccines, going through the best available data on their efficacy, side effects, and how that might play with her medical conditions. And I'm really proud that ultimately she decided that the best thing for her health and the health of her students who can't get vaccinated was to go ahead with the mRNA vaccines. And so I'm proud to report that she has had both doses of her mRNA vaccine. She had minimal side effects, no complications. And she's thanked me for the time that we spent together answering her questions. So ultimately, if you're unvaccinated, I encourage you to get vaccinated. But if you're hesitant, please reach out to your doctor's office or your clinic because we want to have those conversations with you. And if you are fully vaccinated, then I encourage you to schedule and get your booster as soon as you can. So thank you for having me. And, and, and look, um, it's also important to emphasize that this is, is your decision. And you might have a spouse or a parent you live with who doesn't want to get it, is against it. You can still privately get that vaccine without uh, your partner your spouse, your parent, uh, knowing if, if that's what keeps the harmony in the family and you are protecting yourself. Um, so make that personal decision to get protected. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to in any way share that with those who you live with. Uh, Dr. Sean O'Leary is professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and Children's Hospital, a pediatric infectious disease specialist. He's the liaison of the CDC's advisory committee on immunization practices. That's the, uh, the famous AKIP that, that meets on, on the immunization for the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society. Dr. O'Leary. Thank you, Governor Polis, and it's a real pleasure to be here. 
Um, I have some prepared remarks. I'm going to focus primarily on uh, talking about children here, but also the importance of, of everyone really getting vaccinated. So just to start out, I want to say that children of all ages have suffered greatly throughout the pandemic, both directly from COVID-19 infections and indirectly from unintended consequences such as school closures, worsening of an existing mental health crisis, and for many, the loss of a parent or other loved one. And while it's clear that COVID-19 is more likely to lead to severe illness and hospitalization in adults, it's incorrect to say that it's a benign disease in children. With, with well over 500 pediatric deaths as I speak, COVID-19 fits squarely in the top 10 causes of childhood deaths in the United States. We've taken care of well over 1,000 children hospitalized with COVID-19 at Children's Hospital Colorado, and unfortunately have had several childhood deaths. The, the highly contagious de Delta variant has changed the calculus for risk to children considerably. It's so contagious that in the next several months for unvaccinated persons, the question is not if they will get infected, but when. Since this September, infections in children are at the highest point they've ever been during the pandemic, and many children's hospitals have recently had overflowing ICUs. Fortunately, we here at Children's Colorado have been able to meet our recent surge, but we're in a difficult moment in time. Respiratory viruses that we normally see during the winter are at very high levels right now. And those, those combined with children with COVID-19 have led to a pretty full hospital. At the same time, children's and hospitals across Colorado and the rest of the country are facing difficulties meeting staffing needs, particularly due to nursing shortage due to a combination of factors, including pandemic fatigue. While cases of COVID-19 have started to come down in parts of the US, as you've heard from Drs. Leggett and Governor Polis, Across Colorado, we're still experiencing very high rates, including among children. While the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has been authorized for use in children uh, 12 and older since May, children under 12 have had no opportunity for vaccination outside of clinical trials. And many of these children are in schools with minimal mitigation measures in place and are thus at, sig at significant risk of infection, particularly when community circulation is high, as it is now in most of Colorado. To protect these children and keep them in school, the best thing we can do is to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Vaccination protects not only the person getting vaccinated. When you choose to get vaccinated, you also protect your partner, your children, and your community. Vaccinations for children 5 to 11 year, years old will likely be authorized for use very soon, as Governor Polis mentioned. Once this happens, there are several reasons that children should be vaccinated. First, the vaccine will offer uh, children protection from infection and related co complications such as hospitalization and for some long COVID. Second, many children live in homes with vulnerable caregivers who may not respond as well to vaccination, such as persons with moderate or severe immunocompromise, and that's estimated to be about 3% of the US population. Third, being fully vaccinated means that if a child is exposed to someone with COVID-19, they don't have to quarantine. This is critical for, for preventing school absenteeism as many children already this school year have been forced to miss school and many schools have no remote, remote learning options available for this school year. And from an equity perspective, vaccination of this age group may alleviate some of the longstanding educational disparities that have been exacerbated by this pandemic. Finally, there are roughly 450,000 children between the ages of five and 11 in Colorado representing about 12% of the population. The more eligible people who get vaccinated, the fewer COVID-19 cases and deaths we will experience overall. So as we work towards vaccinating all eligible Coloradans against COVID-19, we must not forget about the importance of maintaining routine childhood vaccines. Globally and, and within the US and Colorado, the COVID pandemic was associated with a dramatic drop in vaccination coverage across all ages as a result of the lockdowns and staffing and supply chain shortages leading to a real risk of pediatric outbreaks of other vaccine preventable diseases like measles or pertussis. Thanks to our robust vaccination program, we rarely see many of these diseases, but many of them are actually more severe in children than COVID-19. So for parents, please check in with your child's pediatrician to make sure your children are up to date. In closing, uh, Governor Polis mentioned I, I work with the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for the CDC. So I've, I've had kind of a bit of an inside view of the development and authorization of these COVID-19 vaccines. I, I just want to share some personal observations. When the pandemic hit in March of 2020, it, it was obviously rough for all of us. 
But for those of us that work in the world of medicine, public health, and particularly infectious diseases, it was pretty clear early on that the only way out of this pandemic would be with vaccines. What I've observed in the last 18 months with the development, approval, and distribution of these amazing, safe, effective vaccines is nothing short of miraculous. We were hoping for vaccines that were 50% effective, and we got vaccines that were more than 90% effective at preventing infection and even better at preventing hospitalization and death. These vaccines are a gift. In a short period of time, communities here in Colorado have come together to somehow get vaccines into the arms of over 77% of eligible Coloradans, saving thousands of lives. This is remarkable, but we're not done yet. We need to get finish that last mile to protect ourselves, our communities, and our children. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Leary and Dr. Leggett. On behalf of the state of Colorado, I want to express our gratitude and thanks uh, to you for all of your fellow practitioners across the state for your work, uh, your day-to-day -day work, and now your work to end the pandemic and save lives by encouraging patients to get the safe, effective vaccine. Uh, without you know the work of so many of our medical professionals, we would have lost a lot more Coloradans um, to this, and America and the world would have lost a lot more as well. As the doctors have mentioned, uh, this at, at this point, this is largely a pandemic of the unvaccinated, but unfortunately it also pulls in those that are immunocompromised, weak, uh, and have other healthy conditions, even if they their vaccinations are less effective. So it's about yourself, but it's also about love thy neighbor. Uh, for those Coloradans who haven't been vaccinated yet, consider what Dr. Leggett and Dr. O'Leary have shared with you. Uh, we are so fortunate uh, uh, to have the vaccine as a tool to fight this virus. Vaccinated Coloradans have already done their part. Some are due for a booster and they should get it. But sadly, our unvaccinated neighbors continue to be at very high risk of disease, death, and hospitalization. Uh, in fact, so high a risk that our hospitals have 966 people. Over 700 of the COVID patients in our hospitals are unvaccinated and don't need to be there if they took the simple step to prevent it. If you haven't had a chance yet, now's a good time. Get vaccinated covid19.colorado.gov, click on vaccine providers near you. Uh, if you're around others indoors, um, good idea to wear masks to protect yourself while we have such a high level of viral transmission in our state. And with that, we'll answer questions. Governor, Governor nine states with rising COVID rates. Are you considering changing your stance at all, implementing more stringent public health order to finally quash you know, this fifth wave? Yeah, we we were uh, spared the kind of uh, uh, high peak wave that many other states experienced in this month or two. What we had instead uh, was a uh, a relatively high plateau that we're still seeing. Where again, today hospitalizations went down and went up for three days. Uh, we obviously watch this every day. Uh, we have always used our hospital capacity as our north star. Uh, the simplest thing that we can do to end this uh, threat is to get vaccinated. And as I showed on that chart, there are counties like Boulder, Broomfield, Eagle, where they've reached the vac effectively the vaccination levels where they already have a quarter of the hospitalizations uh, of other counties with lower vaccination rates. And that's encouraging, I hope. It's a light at the end of the tunnel, I hope, to show that once you get to the 75 percent, 75 to 80 percent of the total population, we're there of the eligible population, of the total population, and the approval of the youth vaccine will help. That there's a major drop off in hospitalizations, and uh, there are, you know, in in the hands of the people of uh, counties that continue to have high hospitalization rates is a powerful tool to end the pandemic. And it is, to be clear also, it is the most effective tool. Again, wearing masks indoors around others, great idea. We model that when we come in. The county I live in requires it indoors. But the vaccine is more effective than masks. Um, you know, there's a lot of data on masks that shows they might have somewhere around a 50% reduction in transmission, maybe a little less with regard to the Delta variant. Vaccines, 90% plus with regard to severe outcomes. So uh, the very best mitigation measure, measure is to get vaccinated. And of course, we're supportive of other measures along the way, including increased ventilation, mask wearing, uh, and avoiding large gatherings indoors. Another interesting trend is happening with vaccines, showing that more people are getting their boosters than their first shot. Are we seeing that in Colorado? And how concerning is that to you? 
Yes, uh, more people are getting their booster than their uh, first and second dose. Uh, we can give you the, the numbers, but um, we've been seeing somewhere in the three to 5,000 a day range for first dose, similar, three to 5,000 for second dose, which in and of itself, it's good. We're not, we're not dropping demand, uh, but we're seeing 10 to 15,000 a day for boosters, some days even more. That's great. That's wonderful. Uh, the boosters are going to many of those who are most vulnerable, who have the biggest drop off in protection from the two vaccines. Everybody over age 65 who got the Pfizer vaccine should get the booster. And uh, again, my 77 year old, 77 year old parents got Moderna. They got the booster. I'd encourage folks to do that too. You simply have to check off that you have a weakened immune system. Uh, one thing that's clear about this virus is by nature of age alone, if you're in your 70s and 80s, you do have a weakened immune system vis-a-vis -vis this virus. Uh, and that'll be formally approved, we believe, very soon as well for the general population. Great question, John. So um, the process is, is that the FDA is going to meet October 26th to review the data that Pfizer submitted. And um, then probably in the, in the coming hours to days, we'll make a decision on authorization, uh, assuming it's safe and effective, which based on the press release um, from Pfizer, it appears to be. We haven't seen the full data set yet, but that'll be coming probably the day before that meeting. Um, shortly thereafter, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices will meet to decide uh, to, to, you know, do we follow this recommendation for the U.S. population? And they will go through um, a lot of the data around um, is it safe, is it effective, and then looking at the benefits and risks. Uh, and then they will have a vote, uh, assuming that they also agree that it is uh, recommended for the U.S. population. It will then go to uh, the director of CDC, who will then sign off, usually will sign off on that, and then it would then... Um, uh, be published in MMWR, which is the publication that makes it official. And at that point, uh, then vaccines could go into arms um, of five to 11 year olds. In terms of how that's gonna happen, there's a lot of work that's been going on for months and months in terms of trying to make that happen. Uh, a few things, the vials are probably gonna be different than what we had before. And those vials have been in preparation. So the, the hope is that a lot of those vials are gonna be delivered across the country, including to Colorado, to be ready to go to a lot of different types of sites. Um, so uh, primary care offices are becoming a much bigger player in terms of uh, giving vaccines than they had been earlier in the pandemic, where you remember there are lots of mass vaccination clinics. There will also be uh, pharmacies will, be, will continue to be giving vaccines down to that age is my understanding. Uh, and then of course, uh, there will be you know, school-based health centers uh, can offer the vaccine, some schools, they may have mass vaccination clinics. So there should be a lot of different options. In terms of those specifics, we won't have, a we won't have more on that probably until it's all official. Sorry, yeah, so right now the, the ACIP is scheduled to meet November 2nd and 3rd. And so usually it's within hours after that meeting that then the rollout happens. So probably somewhere around November 4th, 5th, 6th that uh, we'll start to see uh, vaccines being delivered here in Colorado. And initially uh, Pfizer, you think, and then Moderna Correct, yeah, so this is all, I'm all, um, here I'm just talking about the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Um, the Moderna vaccine is, uh, a little, I'd say a month or two behind in terms of uh, where things are for children. Um, and that's about as much as, as anyone really knows right now about that timeline. I'm glad you're on that committee, making sure they get that done. <laughs> uh, we gotta get that done, gotta get that done. Uh, Telephone. Uh, Meg Wingeter from the Denver Post. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. All right. I believe this would be for Dr. Um, which, I, I'm sorry, which doctor? We didn't hear. Sorry. sorry um, I'll, I'll just say my question. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about um, the situation you're, you're seeing now in terms of, uh, you mentioned that it's full but not overflowing um, in with RSV and um, and COVID together, are you, are you seeing things kind of staying stable at a high level, or or how is that trending? 
You know, the, the, um, it's been an interesting uh, year, to say the least, in terms of respiratory viruses. Normally, we have a very big surge of uh, respiratory illness, December, January, February, fairly predictable every year, and pretty much every children's hospital plans their staffing based around that expected surge. We didn't see that last year. And um, we had some hint that in the, from the Southern Hemisphere that we were gonna start seeing some respiratory viruses in our summer, and that's exactly what happened. And so since, I'd say, June, we've had a lot of uh, respiratory viruses, particularly RSV, which is particularly severe in young children and the elderly. Uh, and so there's been a really steady surge, I would say, since June, uh, where we've had pretty, our, our hospital fairly full with patients with RSV and to a lesser extent, COVID and other respiratory viruses. And I wouldn't say that we're really seeing that abate at this point. I think we've been, we've been fairly steadily busy for the last several months. Did you have a follow up? Oh, uh, no, I was just saying thank you. Chris Van Der Veen with Denver, oh, with, uh, with Nine News. I almost forgot for a moment. Um, <laughs> Governor, while most of the country is going uh, down, uh, Colorado, Michigan, Minnesota are states that are going up and in the opposite direction. Our ICUs right now are about 91, 90% full. Uh, a number of hospitals have been going on divert status over the last week or so in the Denver metropolitan area. My first question is, are you getting a good explanation as to what's going on here in Colorado? And two, uh, do hospitals have enough? Do you believe that hospitals in Colorado have adequate staffing to weather the, the winter? So we see different parts of the country peaking at different times. Uh, that's not new. Uh, Colorado has uh, peaked at different times than New York and California. Uh, we are now seeing a increase in the Midwest and upper Midwest down through Colorado, uh, as opposed to Colorado tracking with Texas, Florida, or earlier peaks in, in California. So I, I think every uh, epidemiologist would, would admit that it is a bit of a mystery why at different times it peaks in different places. There certainly hasn't been any good uh, explanation offered to me. It's probably going to be a topic for grad students to write theses on for generations about why at different times there's different peaks. But uh, whatever that is, um, the, the, the fact that we're experiencing a later one is, is, is good news in the sense, it's bad news that it's going up at all, of course, to be clear. But it's good news that we're hitting this increase at a time where we have a higher vaccination rate than states that hit it two months ago. And in particularly the states that hit it two months ago actually had significantly lower vaccination rates than us when it peaked in the southeast, uh, when it peaked in other areas. So uh, no increase is good. Uh, it's it's sad to see um, our progress uh, halted um, and, a, and a very high plateau with some increases uh, the last week or two. Uh, at the same time, I don't think we're going to experience the same level of peak that states that had a much lower vac vaccination rate had uh, two months ago. Governor Polis, Sarah Flower with KSUT News. Uh, I want to look at that first slide that you had showed yeah. us initially with we'll vaccination rates and, yeah. and, and increase of cases. La Plata County here in southwest Colorado looks a bit of an anomaly of almost a 70 percent vaccination rate for those eligible, yet still pretty high uh, cases. If you'll if you'll look at that, uh, what do you attribute that to? And then my second question would be for Dr. O'Leary. Yeah. So first of all, this is a very strong correlation. You can see the line that's the average of the data points. Of course, there's a scattering of points as there always would be, but the downward trajectory of the line shows a very strong determination. Uh, you do see uh, counties that are above and below the line. Um, I think a couple things. One is there's always going to be some static in data points, even with a perfect correlation. And you can't expect every point to fit the line. Uh, second, it's certainly possible that there's uh, increased different travel patterns, different visitation patterns in La Plata County. Uh, it is having its peak at a different time than other areas of the state. But the overall correlation is strong. If La Plata had a lower vaccination rate, it would have a much higher incidence rate right now. And the best path to decrease the transmission rate and the hospitalization rate is to further improve uh, that vaccination rate uh, to 75, 80% of the total population. 
And you have a question for the doctor as well? Yes. For Dr. O'Leary, I'm curious too, as vaccinations are certainly one of a layered approach uh, in protecting our children and school age children in particular, would having a mask mandate help alleviate your hospitals for RSV flu and of course, COVID-19? Uh, well, to put me on the spot, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I've, I'm a big supporter of wearing masks in indoor settings, and it's very clear both uh, across the country and in Colorado that uh, having masks, uh, mask requirements, for example, within school districts is associated with far fewer outbreaks. We've seen that over and over and over again. We saw it last year, and we're seeing it again this year, even with the more highly contagious Delta variant. So even though the Delta variant is highly contagious, yes, it... Um, uh, it, it can be prevented by masking. And so, yeah, I do think masking is one of our important mitigation measures. But again, as Governor Polis pointed out, vaccination is a much more effective mitigation measure. So the more people we can get vaccinated, the better off. Um, and just to comment further on that, there, there have been discussions, you know, around various policy ways to approach this, uh, this particular issue. And there are ideas floating around out there, for example, of schools that achieve a 90% vaccination rate or something like that could then not have to wear masks, you know, lo and behold. So I, I do think masks are an important part of controlling the pandemic right now. Uh, I'm not uh, in a position to declare that we have a mask mandate, though. I leave that to Governor Polis. You know, I can't comment on numbers specifically, but what I can tell you is um, we've got a very highly vaccinated population at uh, Children's Colorado. Uh, we've had a, a, a requirement in place that that's, uh, started October 1st. We're seeing very few missed, uh, you know, relatively few missed cases of work. And, and I would say what, what we've generally seen, I think it's not just unique to Children's, but um, with mask requirements in place in healthcare settings, on top of the vaccination rates, it's pretty uncommon to pick up uh, COVID-19 within the hospital itself. A lot of the, va the, the breakthrough cases, so to speak, we've seen with hospital employees happen more in the community than they do. So healthcare settings, I think right now, with a combination of mask requirements and um, uh, vaccination requirements in place are very safe places to be in terms of catching COVID. We would we would expect. Uh, I mean, it doesn't matter who you work for. The vaccines protect you with about 90 percent plus efficacy. So whether you work for a hospital or the state or a grocery store, or Uber driver, uh, or you're retired, uh, you're going to see that same level of protection from the vaccine. And your risk profile might be slightly different based on where you work and how you work, but it'll reduce the risk by the same amount. Hello, Governor Jesús Carrasquel from Noticias Univision Colorado. Governor, en español, ¿nos podría decir cuáles serán las estrategias que usted plantea para garantizar que disminuyan los casos de coronavirus en el estado? Sí, es muy importante uh, que uh, perso más personas obtener uh, el vacuno. Nuestra prioridad es vacunar a todas las personas que no se han vacunado si lo quieren. En cuanto a las personas que ya se vacunaron, que están listas para la vacuna de refuerzo, también es totalmente gratis también ponérselas y estamos actualmente preparados para cuando el gobierno federal anuncie que los niños de 5 hasta 11 años vacunarse lo más pronto posible. El vacuno es muy efectivo, seguro, totalmente gratis. Uh, y es muy importante recibirlo para proteger su propia y también su familia y sus uh, colegios. Thank you.